Have you heard? What we call graphic medicine may have existed for some time. It may be ancient, the use of sequential images and words to detail or instruct some medical procedure, illness, or state of health. Image and word were being amalgamated, hybridized to serve human health before we had a fixed name for it. Medical illustration, art therapy, graphic pathography, healthcare comics, patient art, instructional diagrams, maps, thanks in no small part to Dr. Ian Williams in 2012, recognizing that we needed a coherent term under which to capture all this, we arrive at graphic medicine. It does not stand alone. Graphic medicine places itself at the overlap of many different spheres from narrative medicine to disability studies, to quality management and healthcare, to media studies. But the place our discussion begins to give us both the necessary terminology as well as a sense of the progress made over the past 30 years at least is in comic studies. There is no formal start date as to when comic studies began. As Scott M. Smith notes in his chapter, Who Gets to Speak, comics slid their way into academia gradually though his late 80s estimate of becoming visible and viable enterprise on campuses overlooks even earlier works, like Umberto Eco's The Myth of Superman or Ray Brown's founding of the Department of Popular Culture at Bowling Green State University that same year, 1972. Certainly by the 1990s, comic studies was taking form, thanks in no small part to books like R.C. Harvey's The Art of the Comic Book, M. Thomas Inge's Comics as Culture, and vitally, Scott McCloud's hit primer, Understanding Comics. In his 2005 TED Talk, McCloud reflected on comics evolution, tracking and attempting to predict its further durable mutation. Do smartphones take something away from the experience of reading a comic? Or do they liberate it from something that has been holding them back? Is the optimal comics experience achieved with a newspaper broadsheet, a stack of floppy staple bound issues, or an expertly bound bookshelf collection? The cloud search for durable mutations of the comics medium could also be extended to the growth of its genres. War comics, for instance, have ebbed and flowed in popularity, while horror comics have always maintained a subtle, steady presence. The crime genre has peaked at times, and the funny animal genre will always find a market with children at least. And of course, there's the superhero, though not always as commercially superhuman as one might think. Autobiography, adaptation, high fantasy, romance, and sci-fi are genres that cross media. But in terms of comic solely, graphic medicine has become its own manner of durable mutation. A compelling cross-reference with potential sub-genres including graphic pathographies of cancer or clinical memoirs. What you need to hear, admittedly, is that much of the discussion here is with English language comics for a domestic US market. As much as the superhero was created in America, comics themselves were not. Tracking their pedigree at least back to political or editorial cartoons of Europe in the 1800s. McLeod himself would prefer to see the origins of comics as sequential art dating back to ancient Egyptian times, others would even give it prehistoric roots. Comics as a medium would find their own distinctive forms and degrees of importance in France, Belgium, South America, Canada, and Japan, sometimes ahead of U.S. sensibilities. 
In France specifically, comics, or bande dessinée, has been designated the ninth art, preceded only by architecture, sculpture, painting, music, dance, poetry, film, and television. What is important to note here, at least in terms of graphic medicine, is that all of these countries share the same understanding of comics as a medium. One of nine or more, wherein all manner of content and material can be communicated. If comics is the medium, graphic medicine is nearly everything else. Note the authors of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto. Among them, it's an approach to the education of health professionals, as well as an emerging area of interdisciplinary study. And it's more than this. Graphic medicine is also a movement for change that challenges the dominant methods of scholarship in healthcare, offering a more inclusive perspective of medicine, illness, disability, caregiving, and being cared for. The fact that they call their work a manifesto is testament to graphic medicine being no one thing. So, of the many things it can be all across various nations, is graphic medicine a field, a genre, a method, a tool? The answer can be yes to any of these. So it is important that we call out the way in which we mean it in context. As a subject of study, it can be considered a field, an area of education and content within certain theoretical or real world applications. One might argue that it is a subfield of comic studies, of narrative medicine, of any of the disciplines listed previously, but that largely depends on one's area of expertise and their immediate goals for the scholarship. When we do apply it in the real world, such as a clinical or outpatient setting, what we are studying here becomes a method, a way in which to engage with healthcare in general or a patient's health specifically. Further, if we prescribe some aspect of graphic medicine, encouraging someone to create their own or introducing them to a particular publication, then we might see it as more of a tool or a treatment. This could also be a tool for the healthcare worker to use as much on themselves or their organization as someone they are treating. If graphic medicine is a genre, however, that means that the works applicable to it share certain conventions or elements. Therein lies a challenge. That is, a majority of the works of graphic medicine are narratives, either fiction or nonfiction, and sometimes even both. But a few are distinctly non narrative, expressing sensations and feelings rather than stories. There is no set length to a piece of graphic medicine, and there is no limit to the time period. With the exception of it being visual, McLeod recognizes how comics mimic all five senses through vision alone, there is no limit on style or form. And the target market, the intended audience, and the reach of a work can be anything, anyone, and any amount, anywhere. As we will explore, all semester. Graphic medicine has such a wide scope that forcing a single label or inherent characteristic on it may do us ultimately a disservice. However, let's conclude by exploring just one, namely the power of comics highlighted by the editors of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto. Smith ends his chapter with an excerpt from Nate Powell's Swallow Me Whole, sharing it and in turn inviting readers to both interpretation and empathy. 
That is a key strength of comics in general, and perhaps the core element of graphic medicine. Comics give voice to those who are often not heard. The irony here is intentional. That a silent medium and invisible art would be discussed in terms of hearing, but this metaphorical hearing is what allows us to absorb these experiences, these instructions, these sensations, and these pains within ourselves. Reviewing an array of titles that would qualify as graphic medicine for the journal Literature and Medicine, Hilary Chute says, in this newly respected form, words and pictures can create a literary and effective register that powerfully represents stories of illness that people want to see and to read. Graphic medicine presents us with the voices we in healthcare need to hear as well.